I, I put nods there, but like your any any tool that you're gonna want to you know practice with at the range, make sure that that's in your weapons case. Um, just so like all your attachments and everything that has to do with the weapon is with the weapons for accountability purposes. If you start throwing a lot of that stuff in your kit bag or a range box, like it's it's super easy to misplace it or forget it at home. Now you've made the trip out to the range and you're, you know, you're without what you want to do. And now you have to adjust your, um, your training schedule, which really just like lessens your value of your time. And time is the most valuable thing that we have. Um, more so in your kit bag, what you should be looking to do is like eye pro ear pro, um, some gloves, you know, like if you, if you are trying to like, um, simulate like where you're going to be, if you have, um, like a, a chest rack or something like that, a pistol belt, you know, extra magazines, um, and, and your ammo. Those are things that like aren't expendable, but if you were to forget like some ear pro, you'd be able to go to Walmart and pick up a set of foamies for like, I think they're like 25 cents. But, and it wouldn't ruin your range. Like you'd be able to go and like augment any of these types of things, barring the uh, helmet plates and pistol belt, but really it wouldn't affect your range day that much. Um, and then you have your range box. So always have a cleaning kit with you. Um, if you're gonna bring your rifle or your pistol, like have the proper cleaning kit for that weapon. Um, Bores are not in bore snakes are not interchangeable. Like if you have a nine mil bore, you're you're gonna need a nine mil bore snake. If you have a five five six or a two 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 three or um, three oh eight for long guns and above, get the proper bore snake. Get the proper cleaning kit for that weapon because if you start running stuff through that that is not made for it, what you're gonna do is like, um, and I'll go into this more in more detail, especially with long guns. Um, that rifling is super important. You know, the one, the one and 10 twist, um, the more you fire it, the more that carbon builds up. And I think it usually takes for our, for our guys and like the last sniper rifle I zeroed, we did a hundred single round shots. You'd shoot once, send the boar snake through, shoot once, send the boar snake through. It's basically prepping that barrel so it stays the most accurate. But if I were to do that with the wrong bore snake, um, being that cleaning that cleaning pipe that goes through the bore, and I do it the wrong direction, it would very well not damage, but it would it would give me um, at a hundred. You know, people do middens of angle, but at a hundred meters, it would it would deviate my bullet by a substantial amount. Whereas like when I start pushing out to a thousand, 2000 meters, I'm not even close to hitting the target. So make sure like the cleaning kit is very important that it's um, particular. It doesn't need to be a Glock cleaning kit for a Glock weapon. It just needs to be the correct bore for that weapon. Um, and then cleaning oils. So like um, in the, in the military, the basic one is uh, CLP. I don't, I don't quite like it because uh, it's it's very oily. There's some uh, T TW50 is a brand that you can get um, off the shelf. It's a little bit more expensive, but um, a lot better use for um, oils for your for your firearm. Um, just having special tools. So if you're going to bring several sights out, or you have several weapons with different optics on it. Make sure you have the torque wrenches for those optics, or else you're gonna, or else you're gonna ruin the the mounting brackets, and then it's again, it's pretty much like the boar snake. It's just you're putting more and more deviations into your shots that you don't need to. So make sure you have all your torque wrenches and things like that. Targetry, um, trash bags so you can clean up after yourself. Um, some private ranges and then some public ranges. It's always nice to like leave the place better than you got there. It's uh, you never like walking up and there's a bunch of random garbage. I, I can't stand, that's a pet peeve of mine. Um, foamies, so some when I say foamies, it's like the rollable um, earplugs that you can put in. Just have extra ones because let's say your buddy, uh, a friend says like, hey, um, I, yeah, I'd love to go shooting. Well, 
they're probably not going to bring their own safety stuff because they just don't know what they don't know. So having an extra set of, uh, of several sets of those like cheap earplugs, uh, 3M makes them. I know there's like this whole lawsuit going on with them. They work well. Um, the 3M foamies or, and some like cheap, uh, what I would say is um, you go to Home Depot and you can get those uh, clear, clear lens uh, working glasses. They're pretty ballistic because they're made to, uh, if you like shear a nail or something, it won't go through. Don't get anything much cheaper than that, but have a couple extra pairs of those uh, glasses in there and um, then pasties. So you want to get the most out of your target tree because there's no real need. Like if you shoot up a target, um, they're pretty expensive when, when you start doing it on like a large level, but like, there's no need to, to keep putting new and new and new targetry up. If you get, if you have a cardboard cutout target, just get brown pasties. Um, they're one inch by one inch square, um, stickers and they come in a roll of like 2000 to a roll and it will extend the life of your targets a lot. Some of the other things um, to think of is like a shot timer. If you want to look into like, you know, draw to fire times, you can start working and like have a tangible number. Um, what they do, if you guys aren't uh, experienced with them, it's basically a uh, microphone that when, when you press it, it records the noise from you drawing your weapon or moving to your shot fired and it will record the distance that it takes you to do that. So if it takes me a, a like two seconds, it really doesn't. It's usually under a second to draw and send my first round. I can start saying like, okay, I'm at a second, I'm at a second. Now, you know, with different, um, it's a really good range tool because then you can start looking at like, okay, now it's nighttime. All right, what are my times at nighttime that I'm actually hitting targets? Well, now I'm dehydrated, you know, like, okay, so I'm dehydrated and it's nighttime. So I know that my times are going to be longer, but I can now have a, a, um, a uh, tangible number that I could work against to try to start getting shaving time off. If I just do it randomly all the time, I can think that I'm doing awesome and not have a fallback or a benchmark of what I'm trying to hit. So shot timers, um, those are those are basically the loadout things that you're going to want to bring with you to the range to again to optimize that uh ability for you to shoot proper not properly but like to get the best bang for your buck because some like some private ranges charge you at least around us they charge you per the per hour per half hour um are there any questions about this the loadout i i think it'd be easier to just ask right now Everyone, does does that make sense? Am I going too fast or is everyone kind of grasping this? No, you're good. You're good. Okay. I would say if anybody has a question on the bottom, it, uh, there is uh, an area for uh, chat. If you want to put a question in there, otherwise just raise your hand and, uh, and we can call on you. But why don't you go ahead, Greg, you're doing fine. Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll continue on then, guys. Yeah. Um, hey, Greg. So, yes. Uh, my audio comes in slow. Just stand by, please. When I'm at the range, I use the snake, uh, but I don't find that it cleans as well, so I end up cleaning again at home. Is that about what you do? Yeah, so what, what I like to do is just have the boar snake in my range, like in my range kit, because it's quick and easy. I don't have to really dismantle the weapon at all, um, but it will clean it decently. And like they have a life expectancy on them as well. Like the, the boar snakes themselves have a life expectancy. Um, so if it's not cleaning it as well, I, I would recommend maybe picking up a new one. Um, there, you could get them off Amazon pretty, pretty easily or whatever at whatever uh, re retailer. But yeah, definitely when I get home, I'll, I'll go through my weapon so thoroughly. Um, at the range, we kind of call it a field strip. We'll like take it apart randomly and wipe it down. If we do a day shoot and then a night shoot in between, we'll kind of like wipe it down, re-grease it and like throw it back together.
but at home we're taking it fully apart, taking the bolts out, taking everything out, scraping the carbon off where we can, and then reassembling and putting it up for storage. Does that, does that kind of clarify that? Yes. Awesome. But yeah, I do, I do recommend like range time. Like if, if you're just like going out to lunch or something and then you're coming back to the range. Yeah. Do, do the field strip, kind of wipe it down, kind of get all the gunk off or run, run a boar snake through. But definitely when you get home and you're, you're down to like really kind of take it apart a little bit further, go ahead and do that and uh, go, go through a thorough cleaning before you put it up in a safe or storage, wherever you're going to keep it. Greg, do you replace your uh, boar snake uh, periodically or clean it or, or is it a one-time use? What do you do with that? No, the boar snake is more, is, is like, you, you can get a good amount of cleanings out of a boar snake um, here. You know what? I should have, I should have looked for a, uh, a picture of one. But um, yeah, that, that thing, you could run through a, a barrel tons of times. Um, you just, if, if it's not getting it clean, like um, Mr. Uh, Go, Dick, Dick was uh, talking about, um, I would look into getting a new one at that point because, you know, as you run it through, it, it thins it out. It thins that material because there's um, some copper that's usually woven into the material and it's kind of like steel steel wool where you just like pull that that full snake through the uh through the barrel and it it'll be it'll be clean does that make sense yeah thank you is, is that for um handguns as well yes for pistols and yeah about how often would you do that for a pistol depending on how much how, how many rounds you fire so every um every barrel has a length of how many rounds go through it. Um, pistols. So again, and that, and now like, we'll, we'll look at it. I'll, I'm going to look at it like a Glock 19. Yes. And that's a boar snake. Exactly. Um, but let's say like a Glock 19, I don't run a boar snake through my Glock as much as I do my rifle because a rifle if you think the cartridge and the grain to some of the rifle rounds that we're using are a lot, there's a lot more of it. Also, if, if it's a um, gas piston operated rifle, or if it's just like the standard bolt, you're, you're getting more carbon in a rifle than you are in a pistol. So to every, let's say to every three times or four times, you're, you're breaking down and cleaning your rifle and running a boar snake through your rifle you do it once to your pistol. Like your pistol is not, um, barring it being like a Beretta or something that is really tight tolerances. Some of these like really fancy pistols that you can get, like HK has some really tight tolerances. If it's more like a Glock or an XDM or something like that, you can get away with just like running it through uh, once in a while. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Dick, for demonstrating that. Yeah, that was. I, I don't have a boar snake on. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I just happen oh. to have one. <laughs> the um, the next thing I'm going to go through is like just some safety, safety first type of thing. Um, so these are like a must have in any time you go to the range. All right. Um, I put I put some ear pro on here. It doesn't have to be these fancy Pelotors. That's what we get issued. So. I don't have to buy $300, $400 set of uh, headset. They give me five of these and I, you know, like that's what we use, but they have some really good ones. And what I, what I put underneath here is like a, that the DB is for decibel regulator. Um, what's really nice about these is like, um, and, and products like this, they, they sell them for about $50. And the reason I would say to get something like this over just getting the earmuffs that just, hold the noise in, like isolate you, is this you'll be able to hear. So what these, what these devices do, and they've, they've gotten really pretty cheap, um, not cheaply made, just like inexpensive. Um, so if you're talking to somebody, you'll be able to hear them because the decibel regulator in that device will say that it's not a high enough decibel for you to, to hurt your ears. 
But once you hear the clap, like a clap or the, the snap of a round or something, it will muffle that. That regulator inside that device will, will, tone, will tone that down. And it allows you to talk to anyone that's at the range with you. It allows you to be, have a situational awareness of what's going on at the range. Um, yes, I trust, I trust myself really well with pistols and rifles and anything. I've been doing this for years. But when I go to a range, I don't really trust everyone around me to be doing the same safety standard that I am and to be doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing. I, I, can't, I can't trust them. So the more I can hear and see, the better for me and the better for you. So I would look into investing into like a $50, $60 pair of one of these things. Um, they sell them at all gun shops. Again, they take like AA batteries or AAA batteries. You throw them in there and it will give you a lot a lot better situational awareness of what's going on. All right, then some true ballistic eye pro. Um, these, this company is one of the companies we use because, um, and, and trust me, I get like no kickbacks from this stuff. I'm just telling you what I like personally. Um, the reason I like uh, Gator sunglasses are because A, they're jumpable. So like they're halo rated. So I don't have to change glasses once I've jumped to something else. Um, the other thing is they're metal, so they're they're pretty durable, and the lenses are polarized. Um, now, why those like three things come into fact is like, it, is it gives you a pretty good product for for again, not something that's super expensive, but if there's something that I'm going to spend money on, it's my ears, my eyes, and my limbs because I can't really replace them too easily. So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna go ahead and like go to a range where possibly something can injure myself. I can injure myself or, or something can injure my eyes. I'm going to try to protect them as much as possible. If I'm in an outdoor range, I'm using sunglasses. If it's a sunny day, if it's an indoor range, I'm using clear lens sunglasses. Yes, I get it that it, or if it's low light, um, I'm using clears. Again, it's just, you're, you're trying to get something that fits and, 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 and again, these are things that I personally like, but as long as you get something that fits your face and is comfortable for you to wear, and you're not always taking, taking them off because they're uncomfortable or you're sweating or they're fogging up or things like that, because every time you take something off, you're just exposing yourself. And again, multiple people being on the range with you, you want to limit that as much as possible. So I would really look into investing some for, for yourselves, not for like friends coming over or whatever, but for yourselves investing into a good, good pair of iPro. Um, Oakley makes a ballistic lens too. I find that they're, they're pretty expensive and they're polarized. Um, they're polarized uh, covering kind of peels after time. I don't, I've had that happen on, on several glasses, but, um, but I know that, uh, I know that, uh, Gators, it's G A T O R Z, Gators. Um, and I hate promoting them because like they're a Navy SEAL thing, and but it, it is it is what it is. But they're they're good they're a good set of glasses. Um, and then gloves. Oh, sorry. Then um, so gloves. Gloves are uh, super important. Um, and then the other thing about gloves is like. Train, you, you know, you train as you train to train as you fight. Um, if you're wearing gloves, like it gets, it gets a little bit hard to get used to gloves. But when you, when you start using them over and over again, especially like with pistol, what it will help you do is it will help you get not, not get that slide bite um, is what we call it. If you have, you know, you have your pistol grip. Um, give me two seconds. As, as the slide, um, as a pistol fires, it comes back to rechamber, recock and rechamber. Well, if you have your, if you have your finger along this slide um, where you're trying to get as much meat on, on as possible, sometimes your skin will catch in between here. And you'll see, I actually have, I have a pretty good callus going right here. And that's from just like years of getting slide bite. Well, if you wear a, uh, if you wear a good set of mechanics gloves and they're pretty cheap, you could get them at AutoZone. Uh, don't 
go to a gun store or anything like that. Don't spend the ninety dollars on the uh, on those Oakleys with the like uh, protective like carbon fiber knuckles or anything like that. Um, I would say like just go get a good pair of mechanics gloves. Um, and if you have those, that's awesome. I think they're pretty cool. I wish I I, I had them, but I just buy the twenty dollar mechanics gloves. They they work great. And when you're getting a glove, you want a glove that's not tight, but it's um, it's mendable. So like you're not super loose through your fingers because that's where a lot of your tangible things are going in as far as like trigger pull, as far as like reloading. So like pressing your slide lock, pressing your, your um, uh, magazine release, all those things are in your fingertips. So if you have a lot of play through your glove in your fingertip, it's gonna just make that more annoying which results in you guys just results in everyone just not using them as much. Um, is there, are there any other like safety items that you guys might have questions on or like want, want a word of advice on or anything like that? Yeah, Greg, yeah. Uh, when you buy oh. gloves, do you cut the tips off? Why don't you repeat that, Dick? Uh, I yeah, asked Greg so if he bought funny. So I believe the que I believe the question was when I buy gloves, do I cut the fingertips off? So now this is like I and I, and I hate this answer, but it's it's really if I'm in a hot location, I will because your your hands get a little sweaty. In the gloves and you get a little bit more tactile tact tactfulness through your fingertip than a glove tip but um i ran into a problem this last deployment to afghanistan i think we were we were right around eight nine thousand feet elevation and it was like negative nine degrees outside and i had cut the fingertip off my glove because that's how i had always done it and now i'm holding a metal weapon with a fingerless glove and like my finger was like it was hurting and i was i was wishing i i hadn't done it so being in Arizona, I don't see that being a huge problem for you guys. But um, yeah, uh, if you if you want to, you can go ahead and like. But I really only do the index finger of my uh, of my uh, gloves. I don't I don't do any my thumb or anything else. It's really and what I'll do is I'll cut it down to the first. So this being the first knuckle, I'll cut it down to the second knuckle. So this whole this entire thing is free floating. Does that that makes sense. Yes, thank you. But again, if you're going, if you're going to be in cold weather, just go buy a new pair of gloves. <laughs> <laughs> or suffer like I did. I don't know. You know, any, any other questions on like the safety, like the major, these are the major safety items that you're going to want to look, look into packing out. All right, Joe, uh, you need to unmute. I can't do it from my screen. Joe Ingalls, you're going to have to unmute from your side. There you go. Just a quick thing. Um, I purchased some gloves for my son, who is a cinematographer. The gloves that I got him, the fingers, index finger, could open up so he could operate the camera and then close it up because he's films all over the world and like you were saying in really, really cold areas, <clears throat> hot areas. So there are gloves that are specifically made to give you that index location. There you, there you go. I knew there'd probably be a product out there. I just didn't know about it. <laughs> That's awesome though. Yeah. Like, yeah, if you have, like, I know there, there used to be like, they used to call them the taxi cab mitts, you know, where it's like, a mitt, but you could fold it all the way back and have your fingers out, um, anything like that. But the reason, the re and if those are like, if that's for photography and cin cinematography, I'm sure it's pretty, it's a pretty nice tight glove. So I'd look yes. into that. Yes. Did I? No, I think we're all set, Greg. You can go ahead. Okay. So the, the other thing is, is just make sure that it's like, the, the reason I like the mechanics gloves and if the cinema, cinematography gloves are the same thing, just make sure there's like, it's a good material. It's like a, le a leather or a, I, I like leather better. 
for the palms. The reason being, like, if it's anything other than that, when you when you touch something hot, if you touch your barrel or you touch your suppressor or something like that, that that like pleather material, that like plastic leather, is going to melt, and then it's going to melt to your hand. So that's why that's why mechanics wear these gloves because they're working on engines that could possibly be hot. Again, same thing for us. If the if the rifle barrel is hot or thing is very warm, you don't want it to melt to the barrel, and then you don't want it to melt to yourself as well. Good to go. Yep. Go ahead. All right. Awesome. Moving on then. If there's no further questions on the brief safety stuff, so. Let's, let's jump a little bit around. Let's talk about some targetry. All right, these are targets right here. These three targets are targets that you will get the most bang for your buck when you go to a range. They're not the sexiest. They're not the, the coolest. I know there's a bunch of other stuff out there, but the IPSC target on the left-hand side of your screen is the standard when it comes to shooting mostly pistol and you can do rifle with this. Um, because it gives you the A zone hits, it gives you, it gives you the C zone and the D zone. And again, just like that, I was talking about that shot timer, this gives you a quantitative, um, number, or in this case, letter on what you are hitting and how you are hitting, um, the, the best. So, and it's, and they're pretty clear outlines. Um, the other nice thing about this, like I said, it's that cardboard color. So you could buy a roll of pasties and just go up, you know, all right, you shoot five, um, you shoot five rounds, um, take, go bring the target back in, whatever it is, put your pasties on. So your eyes don't get distracted to those holes you already made, put the pasties on. And then it's basically a brand new target. I mean, we'll, we'll use these until we cut that center out. Like we'll, we'll send several thousand rounds through one of these until there's a hole in the A zone and in the two A zones. Um, but what's nice about this is like, you can see that your flyers go into the C and D zone. If you have a flyer, um, you can see what's going on. Um, it, it's a visual aid of what's actually happening from, from trigger pull to impact on, on a target. And it's the size of a, uh, human. So, uh, the top portion of a human. So the, at, at 25 meters, you should be hitting this target. Um, it's five, seven meters with a pistol. Um, if you push it out with the pistol, if you're really comfortable with the pistol, you know, 50, 25, 50 meters. Um, but really, you should be able to get hits and feedback from your targetry using an IPSC. Uh, I just put a standard 25 meter zero target up here for an M4 carbine. Um, that's the same thing as any 223 rifle, um, civilian side, or uh, 556 if it's match grade. Um, this, so this is like your other component that should always be in your range box, um, or should always go out to the range with you because if, if you bump your optic or it falls off or it wasn't tightened or whatever, if you go to the range and like, now you have to re-zero and you don't have a zero target, you can do it. But if you have one of these, it makes it okay. Tom, what, what's up? Raised hand. Um, <clears throat> what, what distance do you uh, practice with pistols? So there now it, it really depends on what we're looking at doing. Um, usually you don't want to go anywhere closer than five meters because in, in between five meters, you're just like, it's just going to be too close. Um, but at five meters, you can still draw in and fire a good round. So five meters plus we'll push it out to about 25 meters. We do a zero with 25 meters um, with pistol. Um, and we'll do pie plates and steel at, at about 10 to 10 to 15 meters is the usual distance we'll, we'll fire with pistols. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, nothing really closer than five meters. Um, you should be, you should be accurate with five to 25 meters with your pistol because uh, anything far <laughs> Yeah. Just yeah. just a comment. I've taken a couple of classes and they've had me shooting uh, as close as six feet and as far away as maybe 15 to 18 feet for okay. defense, defensive shooting. 
Okay. And is that like drawing from the hip, like drawing and shooting from your hip? Or is that like a full, like one to four presentation? Like both. Both. Okay. And, and that's, and that's perfectly fine as um, I, so what we look at pistols for, and it's different in, in civilian world. I, I completely understand that. Um, but what we look for is anything closer than that. We're going to close the gap really fast and we're gonna we're gonna subdue that that person because we have uh overwhelming firepower usually um and then anything more than like you said that 18 feet once you start going pushing for us 25 meters with a pistol if i go into a house or a courtyard and there's a guy on the other side of the courtyard um and I, I will most likely have my rifle in my hand. I'm going to engage with my rifle, even if it's three meters, even if it's two feet in front of me, I'm going to use my rifle. Now, if I'm looking around the house, if everything seems to be okay, and like I'm looking around the house at this point, and I go into a room and there's there's a uh, uh, enemy combatant at at that point um, that is that is trying to engage me as well, I usually have my pistol out because I'm a, uh, it allows me a lot more move maneuverability if i need to go into a crawl space or if i need to go into the attic or if i need to look around um and at that point any anything 25 meters and in i'm going to use my pistol because it's going to be in my hand if it's 25 meters and out i'm going to transition to my rifle bring my rifle back up and vice versa um the the other thing is is as as i use my rifle if i again separate scenario not to get too far off topic but if I go into a compound again, like, and it's a courtyard and I go in and I have a misfire or something with my rifle, I need to be able to transition, pull my pistol out, present my pistol and engage that target at 25 meters. Usually anything farther than that, um, I'll still be active, active and accurate um, up to about 50 meters, but 25 meters, I could put um, mold, like I could put all my shots in the, in the credit card. Um, that's what we call, if you look at the IPSC target, the A zone in the top is that like, we call it the, the light switch. It usually turns them off pretty quick. Um, not to get too, too disgusting about it, but that's what I'm looking for. And at 25 meters, I can hit that pretty regularly, but it comes with a lot of practice. Um, pistol shooting is a perishable skill. So just because you're a really great pistol shooter, a month ago, if you go to the range again, you're going to have to warm up. And I'm going to go through some drills that you can do to, to make yourself a really good pistol shooter. But does that clear that up? Thank you. Awesome, Tom. Anything else on yeah, that? Greg, uh, Greg, do you have a strategy when you practice at the range or, the, or, or you certain objectives you're trying to do? Or is there something you would do routinely and then maybe you focus in certain areas after that? Yeah, and I, and I will I will definitely touch on that uh, later in this slideshow, um, and and I'll give you guys what not not exactly what we do, but something comparable to what you guys can do um, to make yourselves like really good, really. Uh, and it's not good; it's just like proficient in in this in the art of shooting because it's an art; it's not a science. What I do for myself could be completely different than what you would do for yourself. So I'm not saying what I do is is the gold standard. I'm just saying that's what we do because it works. Um, but I'll go into that shortly. Okay. Um, then on the, uh, the middle is that zero target. Again, make sure that you have a zero target. Um, <laughs> and for pistols, you don't need a zero target. Okay, pistols, again, you could use an IPSC target and put a pasty in the middle, put it out to five meters and uh, just shoot at that. And that, that'll, that'll show you. Um, where you're where you're looking at with your pistol then if you get start dialing if it looks like you just shot a uh, shotgun and all your shots are all over the place bring it into three meters uh, and then once you start dialing it in once you start like closing that shotgun group into it looks more like a looks more like a grouping start pushing it back out and like challenge yourself that way but pistol is very very it's don't get discouraged there's a lot of things that go into pistol shooting that a lot of people don't think about and I'll go over it in a little bit. But for a rifle, have have a 25 meter bolt zero just so you can zero your rifle in case something happened 
during movement or you haven't fired your rifle in a long time and maybe maybe you know whatever it turned like the optics have turned and you're you're just not zeroed anymore other things uh humidity elevation weather it are factors that go into uh things so if i zero my rifle in north carolina if i came out to you guys in arizona i would re-zero my rifle before i started shooting if i go out to afghanistan and my elevation goes to eight thousand feet i would re-zero because all of that stuff um uh, all the atmospherics actually do take part into uh, how how accurate your shots are. All right, and then um, what we use is the uh, anatomy IPSIC target. So that's the acronym underneath is the IPSIC. Um, I think it's International Pistol Shooting Contest Targetry. Um, I think that's what it stands for. Please don't quote me on that. Um, but that kind of shows you where the A zones are, where the B zones. Um, or D and C, C and D zones are. I'll go into some other stuff now. Um, it, here's some other targetry. So uh, yeah, fun targets, fun to put up every now and then, but you really, um, the feedback isn't as great. Yeah, you could say I got them in the lungs or I got them in the brain and all this stuff, but those those zones are, what get, are, are what's gonna show you um, what you're doing with your rifle or with your pistol a lot clearer than, than a uh, zombie or a, or a, um, whatever, you know, Osama bin Laden targets. I mean, we use them all the time for fun, but they're, they're, they're not for getting anything out of. And then on the, the next two right ones, I put up some steel targets. Um, that's, that's more for long gun and for pistols. You can use both. Um, just make sure that the steel that you're shooting, you can't just go buy a piece of steel at a tractor supply company or Home Depot or something and start shooting it because it's going to frange a lot. It, it, it is a ballistic steel that it, it will not penetrate with the rounds you're shooting and all you'll get are these marks. So what I do is I bring, we bring a can of spray paint, usually white, yellow, if we want to make it very visible or if we want to make them harder targets, we'll spray paint them, uh, green or brown um but what that what that does show you is it shows you where your marks are instead of just leaving it bare if you leave it bare it's going to be very confusing on where where your marks hit especially at distance um so this center one is a uh I, it's a high percentage shot meaning that like that should be a much you you should be much faster at engaging something like that and hitting properly than the one on the full right hand side, which is a low percentage shot, which means the target in the front is a hostage and the swing arm, that red plate is your shot. So that is what we call a low percentage shot, which understandably takes a little bit more time to engage because you don't want to hit your, um, <coughs> you don't want to hit your uh, hostage, quote unquote hostage, but your steel man. I mean, you can on the steel, it doesn't really matter. They don't complain too much, but you know, in, in real life, it's kind of a, it's kind of a frowned upon, I would say. Any, uh, any questions on these types of targets? I'm not seeing anything. Um, are we? No, good to go. We got about 15 more, 15 more minutes, Greg. All right, cool. So I'll, so I'll, I've already touched on safety. I'm just going to hit it really quick again. Um, just know what range you go to, know the rules and like the, um, know the range rules. Like if they don't want you moving and shooting, don't move and shoot. If they want you to be stagnant and like come with the ammo separate, just know all of those things before you go, because it's kind of like one of those party foul faux pas things. If you go and you just like break rules right off the bat, they're going to be a lot less susceptible for letting you shoot. Um, treat every weapon as if it's loaded. Um, just always, always, always treat every weapon as it's loaded and, and on fire. Um, don't, don't ever think you're too cool to do that. Like that is the, like, I know in Black Hawk Down, they said, this is my safety. That is like very old school. Don't, uh, don't do that. Don't follow that, um, that example. Um, everyone on a range is a range safety just because you might not be as experienced as other people doesn't make you less of a less of a responsibility to see something and say something if you see someone flagging people ie 
pointing the weapon in directions of, of human beings or, you know, walking in front of other people and doing unsafe things, say something. If, if people can't check their egos at the door when they go to the range with live ammunition, they have no, no, no purpose being there. Okay. If you, if you can't take constructive criticism from someone and say, Hey, what you're doing is unsafe. Um, can you please just, all right, cool. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I, I had a thousand things going on. I didn't realize it. Thank you for, uh, thank you for pointing it out to me. Just, um, just as long as you follow those basic things, guys, um, you'll have a lot of fun at ranges. Um, any, any questions on that? All right, cool, 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 cool. So two, two main different types of ranges is uh, a KD range is what we call it. So a known distance, um, excuse the spelling if I spell anything wrong. Um, but, uh, is usually known distance is usually for long guns. Um, it means like, okay, I know this targets at 300 meters. I know this targets at 800 meters. I know this targets at, uh, 900 meters. That way you, when you're doing your holds on your reticle, you know, okay, at 300 meters, I need a hold dead center on my crosshairs because I zeroed at 25, 300. If you're pushing out to 900 meters, okay, I have to drop down to the 900 meter stadia line in my reticle. So I'm hitting that. That's a known distance range. If you go to an unknown distance range, um, just make sure you have a range finder so you could get the best out of it. So if it's like 982 meters to the thing. So, all right, well, I need to be in between my 900 and my 1,000 meter reticle, but I need to be leaning closer to my 1,000. It, again, it's an art, not a science. And then pistol ranges is anything 25 meters and in. Um, but again, if they allow you to bring rifles there, take your rifle there because you can zero, you can do a lot of up down drills, you can do a lot of good things at a pistol range with a rifle, um, depending on what they allow to happen at their range. Any questions on types of ranges? Let's go. Awesome. So, okay, now, and this is going to lead into a uh, like kind of like if you guys have any kind of questions. So basic rundown of weapons, you have AR platforms. Uh, yeah, you have 300 blackout, you have uh, 308 that come in AR platforms nowadays. Um, it's just your standard like m military M4. Um, it's your most common Colt, you know, Daniel Defense, all these companies make pretty standard AR platforms. Um, it, very good, very reliable weapon. Um, allows for a lot of modifications, personalization of the weapon, um, and so on. Usually shoots a 223 if it's civilian side and it's not a, a matched barrel. If it's a matched barrel, it could take the 556, five, but don't interchange that. Um, if you buy a 223 weapon, if it says 223 on the barrel, do not put a 556 five, in it. Yes, it will fit and it will chamber. It will just ruin your gun and possibly be dangerous because the compression rate is higher on the 5.56. Five, um, AR, I'm pretty accurate. You can, it's, I think it's a one and a half, two, two minute of angle gun, if I'm not mistaken. You can push out to several hundred meters with an AR with iron sights. You put an optic on it and you can push even farther. So, Long gun, I, okay, yes? I had a question. You, you were talking about the 223 and the 5.56. Five, if you have a 5.56 five, barrel, is there any issue in shooting 223? No, no. The, the issue is going 223 to 5.56. Five, okay. But if you do have a 5.56 five, barrel, I know 5.56 five, is a little bit more expensive, but the compression rate and everything is rated for that 5.56. Five, five, there are those match barrels that are 223, 5.56 five, uh, mixed. But yes, you can go, sorry, to digress back to the question, you can go. Uh, 223 in a 556 five, barrel. You cannot go 556 five, into a 223 two, barrel. Good. Okay. Um, again, pressing on long guns. I, I consider it any 308 or higher. So 308s are common uh, hunting rifle. Um, and then you have like 300 Win Mag. These guns are usually more expensive. The optics for them are more expensive. Even and I'll go into optics in a second, but like the optics, everything is more expensive for a long gun. The rounds themselves are more expensive. So if you're going to shoot long gun, I love shooting long gun. The farthest target I've hit with the weapon that you're seeing right there was at 2,500. Um, 
and 50 yards, which came out to 2,200 meters, something around there, um, a little bit over a mile and a half. Um, it took me three rounds to hit the target. I love long guns. They're just expensive to do on the civilian side. Um, but uh, just make sure that whatever you're shooting can absorb that round as well if you're shooting steel out that far. Uh, and then pistols. I put a Glock 19 up there. That's my preferred um, handgun. Um, again, it's the most basic, but it always fires. I I've never really had a problem with it. It's, it's a workhorse of a pistol. Um, and they're not expensive as far as guns go. You could go into H&Ks. You could get the real fancy stuff. Um, I don't have that kind of... Uh, I have a brand new baby. And if I went and spent $1,200 on a H&K pistol... My wife would be a little bit upset with me, I could imagine. But a Glock, several hundred dollars, like six, I think five, six hundred dollars for a good Glock 19. Again, a workhorse of a pistol. Just know that Glocks are a single action or double action safety, meaning the safety is on the trigger pull. It doesn't have a safety itself to safety the weapon. Very safe. I've carried, I've jumped walls, I jump into. I've jumped out of airplanes with these things. I, you know, like as long as you treat it safely, it's a safe weapon. Um, and now I'll, I'll go into some uh, some things about weapons. If so, the the biggest thing I see on the civilian side is people will spend a lot of money on their rifle, and then completely destroy it with the glass that they put on it. The glass being the optic. Um, it would be like going out and buying a Ferrari and putting 13 inch. Um, 13 inch, uh, what's it called? Golf cart wheels on it. Um, if you're gonna, if you're gonna buy a rifle and you're gonna buy, you know, you're gonna spend some money on that. You, you owe it to yourself, um, to get, to incorporate the glass with that purchase. Um, if you're gonna spend a couple hundred dollars on some good glass, there's, uh, there's razor HD. There's like some, um, night force is super expensive. That's like a Ferrari on a Ferrari, but you don't need that. There's comparable glass that is like uh, a couple hundred bucks, but don't go out and buy like a several hundred dollar rifle and then put a $30 piece of Walmart glass on it because you're going to get frustrated. You're going to be like, well, this thing doesn't shoot right. No, it's most likely because the glass isn't uh, calibrated with a, with a tight tolerance. So get, get a good piece of optic too. That's what I aim point. Uh, EOTech for reflex sites are really good. Um, like I said, Night Force and uh, Razors are really good for, um, for Vortex has some really good stuff. Um, and there's usually some deals on those. They usually come out. Labor Day usually has some deals with, uh, with uh, rifle accessories. I know there's... I've got a yeah. question for you. What do you. What do you think about these quick release scope mounts? So the ones that fold over? No, the ones that you can remove with a uh, compression fitting on the uh, Picatinny rail. Yeah, so the, as long, so, I mean, they're great. I, I, I don't see any problem with them, but what I would say is, um, I mean, once you, once you loosen it and like, yes, you can take it off and put it back on the same place when you're dealing with like a hundred meters in and it's not really gonna affect your sight that much. But every time you remove your sight from your rail, you have to re-zero. I mean, it's just like, it, for me, it's a must. So I don't like, like once I get my sight, once I get my rifle sighted in, um, I don't mess with it. And if I find that like, you know, if I'm going on an operation and I have, let's say I actually have some time before the op goes, I'm usually at the range, I'll throw, you know, 10, 20 rounds down range just to make sure that I'm on. And if I'm off, I can adjust it at that point. I really don't like messing with my rifle once I have it set up. So like quick release, not quick release. I don't think there's a big uh, difference. Good. Um, and then uh, I'll go into suppressors real quick. Um, so suppressors are suppressors, silencers, same thing. Um, same, same, but different. But like, uh, the thing you have to be very careful about if you are going to fire with a suppressor, you have to understand that your gun is going to get a lot dirtier than it is. The carbon, basically what the suppressor is doing is it's, it's a flash 
it, it's it's limiting the amount of sound, but it's baffling the sound, but it's also baffling the uh, the the uh, the flame coming out, the fire actually leaving the bore. Um, with that, what happens is a lot of that carbon builds up. So like you said, you know, you want to run a bore snake through. If you're running a suppressor, you need to take that suppressor off. Uh, not, not within that range day, but when you're done with the range, I would take the suppressor off um, if you put a lot of rounds down. If you didn't, if you're just zeroing with the suppressor and then you want to leave the suppressor on, go for it because it, it will change your zero if you put a suppressor on or if you take one off, if you zeroed with a suppressor and you take the suppressor off, your zero will be off. You have to re-zero your rifle. But if you leave a suppressor on for too long and you put a lot of rounds through that suppressor, what starts happening is that carbon will build up where that locking point is on that suppressor and you are going to have a heck of a time getting it off. So what I would recommend is if you go and you're like, all right, this is gonna be my suppressed rifle or this is gonna be my suppressed gun, Go to the range, zero it, and then leave it alone. Um, don't don't keep shooting rounds through it. If if you only have one rifle and you want it to be suppressed sometimes and want it off, just don't keep shooting rounds, uh, copious amounts of rounds through it because you, I mean it's I mean you'll take a hammer and a and a like a monkey wrench to it and it, and you won't be able to get it off. Like we have to take it to our armories when we when it's called melting your suppressor on. It's it's horrible. Um, so just. Be wary of that with uh, suppressors or uh, silencers, AKA silencers. Any questions about that? And then, oh, uh, Greg, we have uh, uh, some people who are interested in guns but have never had one. Do you have a recommendation for a first time gun, whether it be a rifle or a handgun? So, yes. So if you're if you're looking. It, it re really, you have to look what you're looking for, for look, as, look at the gun as a tool. So what, what are you trying to do? If I'm trying to plumb some plumbing, I'm gonna get plumber's tool. If I'm, if I'm looking to build a table, I'm gonna get some saws. And so it really depends on what you want that tool to be. If you're looking for home defense and, and you're not really comfortable and you haven't gotten really good with a pistol, like a pistol is a surgical thing. Um, you have to really be good with a pistol. You have to really train with it a lot. But like, if you're looking for home defense, I mean, maybe a, a high gauge shotgun or, or, you know, like in, in all honesty, because my wife can take the shotgun out of the closet and point it at, shoot it at someone. And if anything, she's going to scare the hell out of them, you know? Um, but, but like doing that with a, doing that with a pistol, there's a lot more moving pieces. So just understand what, what tool you need for the job. And then once you understand, hey, I want to build a table. I really want to use a pistol. Find a pistol. I'd, I recommend Glock, honestly. I recommend Glock for pistols because they're very, very low maintenance. Um, AR, any AR platform for, um, for you know, rifles. Um, shotguns, you have the gamut from Mossberg to Bernelli. You know, it just depends what your price point is. But really, once you figure out what tool you want, then start looking into um and if you have any questions just like send them to my dad and like he'll email them to me and i'll try to get back as fast as possible like hey do you think this is better or this is better and if i don't know i have 12 other guys on my team that do this for a living as well and i'm sure one of them will know great thank sense. you yeah and then the last thing i'll say on suppressors is like you need um there are several different ways to get a suppressor you could put one in a trust and then you also need to do a, uh, it's the same thing for the, uh, for a short, shorty barrel M4, like for the 10.3 inch barrel M4s and in, um, you need to do, it's federal firearms paperwork, it's FFA stuff. Um, it's a tax stamp, essentially it costs s several hundred dollars to get that. Um, there are ways you could put suppressors in a trust for kids. You, you put the suppressor in a trust and like, that's a way to do it as well. Um, just if you're looking to get a suppressor, they usually take some time going through your local sheriff's department, um, to actually get it because it's a federally regulated program. I know, I know I went long on that presentation. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> do you, do no, you that guys, was great. That was great. Got, so I'm going to go through the, I'm going to unmute everybody. 
And uh, we're going to go through. I'll just call your name out. And if you have a question for Greg, let me know. So uh, no particular order. Uh, Karen, uh, you have any questions for, uh, for Greg? No. Okay. Uh, no. George? George, I'm you have no, a question? No, but I'd like to thank Greg for his service. Appreciate that. I'm ex 101st Airborne, so I know all about what he's talking about. Nice. Thanks. Pa uh, Patrick, uh, any questions? No questions. Great. How about you, Joe? Joe Ingalls, any questions? Uh, Greg, thanks for your input. I'm uh, Air Force Security. Four years, so I spent a lot of time behind weapons, which I didn't expect. I thought it'd be technical. Oh well, <laughs> I'm in this. I'm in the search for a um, a pistol right now. Home security. You've uh, touched on a number of items. All good. I'm continuing my research. It is a tool. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Mike and Karen. Uh, any questions? No, no questions. I have Great. a question. Oh, hold on. <laughs> are in this organization. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. How many women are involved in, in this group? Oh, uh, you know, I, I really don't know. Uh, I mean, I have the list of individuals. Some people put their spouses down, uh, or they say, my spouse will sit on the call, but I don't have a name. So uh, it, 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 I would say it's, it's maybe a, a, a third, a, a quarter or a third, I would say. So okay. Karen, Karen, if, if I'll point out to this, all right, women are much better shots than men, hands down. And, and, and that's not a gig against us. We just bring an ego into it. When I bring my wife to the shooting range, she just listens to what I'm saying. To whereas when I bring my buddy to the shooting range, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. So I'm telling you right now, like, all the wives are crack shots on our team. Like, it, pretty impressive. Thank you. Noel, do you have uh, any questions? Noel, I just realized why I couldn't see myself. I had a piece of tape <laughs> over my <laughs> How do I get this on? No, I'm good. I'm good. All Thank right. You, uh, Dick, Dick, how about you? Any question? Take yourself off the mute. Okay, there you go. Uh, I got it. I got it. I'm muted. Uh, Greg, this is super brief and I appreciate it. Thank you for your service. Uh, I'd like to have you back if we can work it out so we can get some more talk on how you practice at the range. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll set something up, I'm sure. Thank you. Stuart, uh, any questions? No, huh? I just, uh, I was a class three dealer for many years. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, David? And manufacturer. Good. Uh, David, any questions? Yeah, if you could hear me, I had some questions on the difference between uh, 223 and 556 because, um, you know, I had an M16 like 50 years ago and that had a kick, but uh, what I shot here on an AR it feels like a BB gun. Do you have any so, reason for that? So I'll, I'll be honest, the um, no, absolutely no offense to the prior service guys in the group right now, okay? But the old musket, that old eight, uh, M, M16A2 is what it was, most likely. One of the first gen M, M16s. The, uh, the buffer stock and the spring that was uh, bringing, uh, rechambering and everything on the round were, is a little bit rougher than um, what is known today. Um, there's really not much difference in a shot from a 223 to a 556. Um, so it's just the componentry is, has come a long way in the buffers and the, um, and the way it's manufactured, the bolt face and everything. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Of course, you know, all those years also, you know, buffered some things too. So yeah, I was sure. just shocked when I shot a 223. It's like, yeah, where's the kick? Yeah, and, and the reason for that is your, your way, what, what gun companies are looking to do is when you take your first shot, you know it comes up and down. Now that's time in between your next sight. So the less it does that, the, the, faster, the faster I can engage a target with multiple rounds. So if I have that, that, large, that large kick, I'm now having to recite. Whereas if I have a short kick, I can just look at it and pretty much just put rounds down range. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Richard, uh, any questions, comments? Take yourself off mute if you are. All right, Julian, uh, any questions uh, for, uh, for the new grandpa, the new, uh, the new father? No questions. How's Nora doing? <laughs> she misses you. <laughs> <laughs> I miss her too. <laughs> Well, I want to thank Julian for recommending uh, we contact Greg and, and Greg, of course, for, for your time and uh, out of this uh, very important uh, early stage in your fatherhood. We, we wish you again congratulations and thank you so much for taking the time to prepare and uh, being part of our group for a little bit. We hope to see you in the future. Uh, I've, recorded, I've recorded this and so anybody who's not on the call or those who are on the call can listen to it. Uh, Greg, you can show it to Nora later on down the road if you want anybody else. Uh, we'll have another meeting uh, next month sometime. So, uh, again, thank you, everybody, for being on the call. Uh, stay safe, be well, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Hey, thank Bye. you, Lily. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you. Great.